Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner and this is Sustainable Hawaii, airing live every Tuesday from noon to 1230 at the Think Tech Hawaii studio in downtown Honolulu. During the first 10 days of this month, Hawaii hosted the World Conservation Congress, held for the first time on U.S. soil. Over 10,000 people from around the world and Hawaii converged at the Convention Center for four days of workshops and presentations, a day of excursions around the islands, and four days of deliberations in the Members' Assembly, setting the worldwide conservation agenda for the next four years. Through a variety of venues, including knowledge cafes, workshops, conservation cases, and high-level dialogues, the forum provided the opportunity for individual countries, regions, and transnational partnerships to showcase their innovative, scalable initiatives and solutions to issues ranging from deforestation, ocean acidification, protection against invasive species, and international trafficking in endangered wild animals. The more than 1,200 forum events ran for 12 hours each day from 7 in the morning until 9 at night. The final four-day members' assembly convened the IUCN's 1,300-plus member organizations to collectively decide on actions over the next four years to address the most pressing and often controversial conservation and sustainable development challenges. The assembly produced what are being called the Hawaii Commitments, which address issues such as sustaining world food supplies, maintaining the health of the oceans, wildlife trafficking, engaging with the private sector, and building resilience to climate change. The Hawaii Commitments highlight nature-based solutions to climate change, such as the restoration of forests and peatlands as essential components of climate mitigation and adaptation. The question I want to discuss today is, how green was this conference that was all about keeping our planet green? On March 22nd, Jennifer Milholland, president of Styrophobia, joined me on this show to talk about whether or not mega gatherings like this one could be sustainable. She was part of the green team that coordinated the efforts to make the first ever World Conservation Congress held on U.S. soil be the most sustainable World Conservation Congress ever. Welcome back, Jennifer. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's always delightful to have you. I love engaging your <laughs> intellect. Thank you. And particularly, we want to hear about your experience in trying to make this the greenest event ever for the Congress and for mm -hmm. Hawaii. Tell me a little bit about the Green Team and how it got formed. Okay, so the Green Team was formed initially because, um, so back in um, four years ago when the event was, the World Conservation Congress was held in um, Jeju, um, there wasn't a Green Team. There weren't, there wasn't a ton of focus on sustainability measures, kind of like we discussed at the last, um, last time I was here that it often gets overlooked. Um, but there was so much waste. There was over a million copies of paper printed on site. Um, there was a ton of waste created. So there was, um, Alex, Alexander Peterson, who organized, who organized logistics for this Conservation Congress, she, she really wanted to focus on greening the events. Um, yeah, we had her on the show. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So, she's very passionate. And um, she says, we are forming this green team. We didn't have a budget. A lot of other teams had budgets. We had no budget. We had a lot of ideas and some pushback about trying to, you know, get ahead of ourselves. Um, but, you know, we, we propose that we, you know, green hotels, we look at zero waste options, we look at plastics reductions, go plastic free. And when the organizers, the higher up organizers of IUCN saw everything we wanted to do, they're like, all right, well, okay, we want to go for the, the world-class level of certification for green events, which is called ISO certification. Um, and this is really hard to get, like the, the Paris talks, the Paris climate talks, they tried to get ISO certification, they didn't get it. Um, so this is very prestigious certification. So. Um, we were formed and we've been meeting for over a year to kind of walk through like what do we address, like what's possible, what's not possible, where do we compromise, what's unacceptable. So we, we had a lot of really good conversations. Um, and like I mentioned, it was hotel member, um, rep people from Green, Bus um, Green Business Program at DBED representing hotels. We had DBED being the State Department of Business, Economic Development and Tourism. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, we had Kukua Hawaii Foundation. Uh, it's um, Jack Johnson and Kim Johnson's uh, foundation focusing on plastic free. Um, I joined from Styrophobia to kind of focus on zero waste efforts. Um, and there were many, many other members from transportation and et cetera that, that focused. So it was cross-sector state City and County of Honolulu, mm -hmm. um, non-governmental institutions, 
and private sector companies like the hotel and visitor industry? Yep, there's a whole bunch of us, and we were all focused on the objective of making this, this event as green as possible and not doing any greenwashing. Like, we wanted real tangible impact. Greenwashing meaning not talking the talk, but walking the walk. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So we were pretty, pretty thrilled, with, thrilled with how things turned out. Well, tell me a little bit about it. Uh, how'd you do with paper? Um, paper was pretty incredible. Um, um, at, at Jeju last year, uh, sorry, four years ago, they... Jeju in Korea. Korea, yes. Um, that was where the last World Conservation Congress was held. Um, they printed over a million copies on site. That, that's not even including um, paper printed materials that, that were shipped to the event, oh but just goodness. on site, just to give some form of metric. And shipping to the event would have had all kinds of other unsustainable impacts. Exactly. Right. Okay. Um, so, but just as a, as a, for sake of comparison, just copies made on site, about a million copies over the course of the event. Um, in comparison, this, this time, time around, um, a lot of this gets credited to Alexandra. Um, she's very passionate about it. We're down to 30,000 copies. So it's a very, a very large decrease. Huge yeah. reduction. And it's, it just kind of reminds us that it's very possible you just have to set the intention and, and stick to it. So what are some of the ways in which that intention were set and you carried it out? I mean, how did you keep people at the task of reduction? This, um, because the, the event itself for the attendees was already geared towards no paper, so they're, um, instead of printing books and libraries and things like that, they just made QR codes. So there was two, two sections. Uh, one was the attendee-facing side, where the, the schedules weren't printed out, everything was online. Everyone was encouraged to have a mobile app. Um, and, so and the mobile app was downloadable on your cell phone so that everybody could just pull out their cell phone and look at the program mm -hmm. and find the workshops. I know that had some glitches. Some glitches, oh, yes. Quite a few, but right. it was a first. It was, and it, and it was a huge opportunity for the convention center to, to try it. Um, and if you, if you couldn't get it on your phone, they had many stations where there's laptops set up where you could just look it up online. Um, there, like I said, there, the libraries that they had where they wanted people to be able to read the different publications, they were pictures of, of the publication with a QR code. So instead of printing thousands of thousands and thousands of pages for every publication, they were, those were all saved by having something you could look up yourself. So you just had to download the QR code? You did. And then put your cell phone on the screen mm -hmm. and the document would pop up? Mm -hmm. And that's the attendee facing side. On the IUCN, so IUCN ended up bringing a fair bit of staff. So as you can imagine throughout the event, they have to print a lot. Well, they normally would have to print a lot themselves. So they kind of have a back working area. But instead, they were, they were given very strict instructions that only the highest priority things were, were, had to be printed, and someone was always monitoring it. So it's just kind of reinforcing, like, this is the goal we've set, stick to it. And we all know that the most difficult thing about sustainability is changing behaviors. And changing behaviors at a mega event that takes phenomenal coordination when you have over 160 countries mm -hmm. participating would be an insurmountable task, you would think. But, but they did it. They did it, and I think, I think that's a really important point that you're making because um, I think a lot of us have had these conversations about when you approach things like zero waste, the immediate reaction is, that's not possible. Like, come on, you're, be serious. And, and it, it's frustrating because, especially going through this year-long conversation about what we can do, it was very apparent that we could have gone zero waste. But in the process, you, you look at what are the concessions you have to make in terms of, okay, we can do that, but it's gonna cost like tens of thousands of more dollars in labor, or it's gonna cost more in this regard. So it's, I never wanna ever hear anyone say that zero waste is impossible. It's just a matter of how much it costs and how much labor you need. Did, it, did it actually cost a great deal more, and was it a great deal more labor? It, it would have if we'd gone fully zero waste. The event didn't end up being fully zero what, waste. What would be the additional labor cost? So for example, um, the originally we and this is actually a good segue into um, into what I was going to talk about too is that along the progression of the discussions uh, we talked about okay we don't we want to go zero waste we don't you want to use any single use items so no single use utensils no single use plates no single use cups uh, anything um, and we were looking at whether or not the convention center has the capacity to wash all those things but they ended up deciding to go concession. So instead of buffets where you can, your staff can collect the plates, can collect the everything and put it in a dishwasher, when you have concessions, it's your, everything you're selling goes off, just goes off. It's almost, it's very, I shouldn't say possible, it's difficult to collect. So had we decided that, had they decided that they wanted to do reusable items for everything given out, there would have had to have been bins along the, around the entire 
convention center, which is, which is three floors, huge exhibit halls, and there would have had to have been probably, I, I would estimate, at least 50 extra staff paid to go around and collect all the, okay. the bins. So the extra labor cost wasn't associated with the paper being produced in documents, it was associated with the food delivery yes food. sorry yeah so okay. that, that's just an example of, of yeah. where additional costs would come in mm -hmm. and another additional cost would be if we want to go compostable products those cost more okay than single-use um, plastic conventional but plastics. if we look at the life cycle cost of those products and the impacts on society we may figure out that they're less costly absolutely yes. absolutely and it, when you look at true costs they are by far less less costly but so maybe that's something we need to build into our future events is looking at the true cost looking at the life cycle cost instead of the immediate upfront cost absolutely. and that's always the issue that is absolutely true and i think that's something we tried very hard to do was point out to iucn who's making who's making these decisions about purchasing that true cost wise what you're what you're talking about in terms of taking in, into account externalized costs and environmental impact social impact um those those costs um outweigh the immediate cost but it, it's the challenge is communicating that to the people that are signing the checks right. and being like this matters a great deal um, but unfortunately we ended up not using for just talking about the waste component we ended up not using reusables because they looked at the cost figures for having more staff to collect to like mm -hmm. the utensils and the plates and everything and they're like we don't have the budget for that mm -hmm. so there's definitely budgetary considerations but by no means, it's by no means impossible. Well, one of the things that was exciting to see how many volunteers there were, mm -hmm. might some of those positions be in, taken up in volunteers or were there issues that precluded that from happening? There, that's a good question. There were issues that precluded that. Um, because the convention center, um, given the, the, what's the word, not notoriety, but given the, um, the fact that there were a lot of like high level dignitaries and presidents and prime ministers and, and um, senior figures in governments, there was a lot of security concerns. Um, so initially we had a lot of volunteers planned out, for example, for our zero waste bins mm -hmm. to make sure that contamination is low. Um, then we start looking at security clearance concerns, like who can get in, who can get in where. Um, so using, using volunteers for a lot of that collection to go in the back of the house of the convention center ended up not being possible. We can plan that for future events where we, we don't have high level security requirements. Absolutely. Terrific. And that was yeah. kind of the point is like I wanted to get ambitious when we, when we proposed a lot of these for, and if we can do it for this, then we learn everything we can and apply it to much smaller events. Absolutely. Yep. Well, I know one of the major projects that you were working on was a composting pilot. Mm -hmm. So tell me how that went. Okay, um, it did not go as planned, totally, <laughs> um, for a few different reasons, but I can tell you um, flat out that I'm really happy with the way it turned out because we, we still managed to capture about 3,000 pounds of compostable material. Um, 3,000 pounds, mm -hmm. that's significant. And that's, it is, um, and we ended up not being able to capture everything. We probably, um, looking at some of the contamination and things not getting put in the right bins, probably only have about 35% capture rate. So a lot more could have been captured because everything at the event, because it was plastic free, everything was compostable. I see. Everything. Um, well, a 35% capture rate for a first time effort, I would say is a win. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, we're um, gonna go to a break and when we come back, I wanna hear more details about how this worked, didn't work, and what are the lessons. Okay, great. We'll be right back with Jennifer and talking about the sustainability of the World Conservation Congress. Hi, I'm Tyler Sabota, and I was actually a guest host on Carl Campagna's Think Tech Hawaii show, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers. And I think you should tune in every Wednesday to find, find out more about what it is. That's all. Take care. Looking to energize your Friday afternoon? Tune in to Stand the Energy Man at 12 noon. Aloha Friday here on Think Tech Hawaii. Good afternoon, Howard Wig, Code Green, ThinkTechHawaii.com. I appear on Mondays at 3 o'clock, and my gig is energy efficiency, doing more with less. It's the most cost-effective way that we in Hawaii are going to achieve 100% clean energy by the year 2045. I look forward to being with you. Aloha. <music> Hi, we're back with Jennifer Milholland talking about the conservation measures at the World Conservation Congress. So we were just talking about the composting program. 
And I know that that was a pilot that was very exciting for how to do it better. Tell me how it usually happens at a conference so we can compare. Sure. Um, so specifically the, the Hawaii Convention Center, um, they are uh, beholden to a, a city and county ordinance that requires them to divert their food waste. They have to recycle it. Um, so one aspect is any food waste that is contained, that's taken up from the kitchen, it's like pre-consumer waste, like food scraps you chop before it goes into a meal. Um, and anything they scrape off buffet plates goes gets picked up by um, EcoFeed. So that's pre-human contact with mm -hmm. the customer. And, and post-consumer, especially when, okay. typically only with a buffet. So if a person finishes their meal, they hand it back to the staff, staff would actually scrape the remaining food waste into a collection bin. So that collectively, that amount of food waste would normally go to EcoFeed, and they take it to Piggeries. Um, the EcoFeed is a local company. It is, yes. Um, they they basically are, are they're, they're a food waste hauler. They they they're intermediary between the Piggeries and and food waste generators. Um, for the for food that's still edible, um, it's called quality edibles. Um, they are contracted with Aloha Harvest to pick up meals, so it still still goes to feed the hungry. Um, the so it goes to food banks. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as other um, nonprofit, private volunteer distribution organizations. Exactly, and the intention being to not waste anything. That if, right. if it can be eaten, mm -hmm. if it can be fed to livestock, that's a higher and better use. So it's a wonderful regulation that the city and county requires. Yes, which, and coincidentally, that we would like to expand statewide. <laughs> but um, <laughs> and anything that ends up in the trash, um, it could be, you know, from the concessions, from any material coming in that gets sent to sent to H Power. Um, so which that's, is our incineration facility. Which is in our incineration facility. So for this event, um, in the, on the green team, we were like, initially we were like, okay, we want to go zero waste. What does that look like? Um, and a lot of times the answer is you recapture your organic materials and send it to composting facilities. So we on, in, Ho in Oahu and Hawaii in general do not have a municipal scale composting facility that can handle the compostable products that can handle food waste all at once. Uh, we do have uh, Hawaiian Earth Products up in Wahiwa. They have the city and county contract to do green waste, mm -hmm. but that's it. They can take a little bit of food waste, but they're not set up to take large amounts of food waste. So would, what would this look like if we did have it? Okay, so we do have a couple pictures. Um, so this is an example of what a, a positively aerated composting facility would be like. So these are those, those are called windrows, and it's a mix of um, green waste, brown waste, so like tree trimmings and things like that, food waste. Um, basically what happens is you can see on the left there, those little stripes, that's where air is forced upward, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's typically mixed. So it, it's, sorry, excuse me, this particular example is not mixed, but um, so that would keep it from going anaerobic, which causes things to rot, all kinds of problems. So that's and that looks like it's on the mainland somewhere where it's cold because there's no leaves on the trees. Correct. <laughs> yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's just an example of what a one facility would look like. And if we can go to the next slide, um, this is an example of one uh, composting facility that has a windrow turner. Um, so this is one that's not on a concrete slab. They just they have the windrow set out of the compostable material, and a giant machine comes and turns it manually. Um, so. Well, I'd like that in my backyard because yes. it's, it's backbreaking to turn yes. our compost. <laughs> it is, absolutely. Um, <laughs> and another example, if we can go to the next one, um, this is an in-vessel composting system. Um, so this is the benefit of this, that it's self-contained, and you can, put, you can put all kinds of things in it that are compostable. You can put compostable products, you can put compostable plastics. So if you've ever seen the compostable forks and things yep. like that, mm -hmm. um, those are rated to 200 degrees typically, so you need to put those in that kind of machine. The and, and the off-gassing of the material is what creates the heat. There's no additional heat added? No additional heat added. It does require some electricity. Um, benefits being that you can put a lot of materials in there and it's self-contained. Downsides are that both of the examples are showing, or sorry, all three of the examples are showing are very labor-intensive. They're opera operations maintenance-intensive. So there's a, it's a lot of infrastructure associated with it, so it's still very expensive. Um, so what we wanted to do was, I was like, I want to go zero waste, and I want it, the materials to get to farmers so we can support local agriculture. Because one of the biggest things that, that plagues farmers is the cost of amendments. You have to ship in a lot of fertilizers, ship in um, compost, things like that. So the hope would be that if we can create a system, create a model where they can create their own amendments by food waste that's already, that's, that we could recapture from events, then that we can 
pretty much a game changer. So, so what did that look like this time? So, uh, thank you for asking. <laughs> um, oh, um, oh, so I'm sorry. This, I meant to reference this slide before. So this is an example of a, a picture from Kupu, Hawaii. This is from the, the piggeries where it goes to. Um, if there is a picture of the so this small is, scale compost. Let oh, me just s point out, though, that that's the food waste that you were talking about that gets scraped off. Yes, And it exactly. goes to piggeries. Got it. Mm -hmm. So now you were talking about this. Sure. So this is an example of, this is a, um, what I would consider a small scale facility. This is, um, this is just an, a sample. Um, this is like a 70 foot by 16 foot facility. So very small compared to the large scale facilities. And you can kind of see that in each bay, that's where they would mix these small batches of compost. And where is this one located? Um, this is over in Waimanalo. This is actually not a composting facility. This is a material storage bay. But I wanted to kind of give a sense of scale and proportion. Okay. Um, so the difference in here being that instead of those gigantic, expensive windrow turners, you have maybe a small bobcat, or you can even turn it by hand. This actually looks like a slightly larger version than the composting facility at Camp Mokulaia. Okay. So we do have them around the island. All right. But not um, that big. Not that big, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the difference being in these, and you can also show uh, one more where they're turning the manual. Yeah, so you can kind of see, like, so these these piles, they still get turned, and but it's happening on a smaller scale. So the reason I wanted to look to this is because I wanted to see if we can create a compost diversion model for food waste generators like the convention center that require far less cost. Mm -hmm. um, because one, one very large, or very, one very common objection to composting facilities here is that, like, it just costs too much. Like these are millions of millions, multi-million dollar facilities. Well, this um, smaller one w w would not be multi-million. It would not be multi-million. However, the high cost in Hawaii would be the land and the opportunity cost of using that land for something else. Right. And we know lease rates are so high here. Which is one of the reasons I wanted to target, not target, <laughs> that sounds terrible. Um, I wanted to work with farmers as a model because they already have the land. Um, they're already working on it. They're already composting. But I wanted to give them the option if they wanted it to expand their program um, to be able to receive food waste. Um, so we wanted to kind of take this opportunity to, to try it, you mm -hmm. know, see if the model would work. Um, so what happened? So what happened? Okay, so um, a lot of it came down to permitting. So we, and I'll just say, like, we, we worked with the convention center staff. They were incredibly supportive. They, they wanted to try this. They want to put in, in place these systems. Um, and so we worked out all the logistics about when we'd be picked up where, where the bins go, what our signage is going to look like. And I worked with the farmers on, on what, when we're going to receive it. Um, but in order to legally take, or in, in order to legally compost the food waste and the compostable products on, on site, we have to have a Department of Health permit. And that, to be candid, took me far longer to write than I would have ever imagined. Um, I, it's the, the permit application. The permit application, yes. Um, it took me over a year wow. to write. So um, it's this thick? It's 218 pages. Goodness. Yeah. So I have to fill out, um, as a small scale facility like that we wanted to do for this pilot, we have to fill out the same application as Hawaiian Earth Products. Oh my goodness. So even, and so basically in the per application you have to address all kinds of large scale issues and, and risk, um, which in my opinion are not nowhere near as probable in a small scale operation. So that was, that was definitely revealed in the process of, we need to revisit how our, how our permitting is done for our small scale, small scale farmers that may want to do a program like this. Um, so in or, what would you do to make that work next time? Make? So you, in other words, you'd start the, the permitting process earlier. You, I, I assume you didn't get the permit. The permit did not come through in time. Okay. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, no, so, so you had the bins, you were re ready to collect, but you weren't able to take the product off-site. Is that it? Well, no. So we were actually, when, when it became clear that we were not going to be able to take the food, the food waste was the big component. Couldn't take their food waste. So we rescheduled EcoFeed, so EcoFeed picked up the food waste anyway. So that still got sent to piggeries, but we were not able to collect it. So we kept the plan in place to collect all of the compostable material. Well, let's see some of that material that you collected and tell me what happened with it. Oh, so this is um, so what's showing now is a is a reusable spork. That was um, I brought that in because we looked at initially um, not not using compostable materials at all, single okay, single use materials at all. So that's that's a reusable spork we looked at using. So um, if can we go to the contamination side? 
Number 12, I think, in your list. Yeah. There we go. So we, we still collected all the material um, because we, we wanted to get the data. We wanted to find out how much compostable material are we actually creating. So what, what ended up happening was that we ended up with a lot of contamination. Um, one reason for this could be that we could have had better signage. We could have, um, we didn't end up getting the food monitors for each bin that we wanted. So reworking on the... The make, food monitors being a person at the bin. A person at the bin. Directing people. So the participants weren't as savvy as we'd hoped. Yes, it was a huge surprise. One, yeah. one of the things we'd reasoned was that like these attendees, they're motivated, they are excited, um, they're going to get it. Yeah, um, and yeah. it turns out that there was probably close to 50% contamination. Wow. Well, that's a huge juxtaposition between those coming to address the big picture conservation issues, not paying attention to the small mm -hmm. details of what it takes to really conserve. It was, and it was, it was especially jarring. Being, being one of the people that was sorting the material to gather the data was that the literal theme of the, of the event was planted at a crossroads. Every, every talk, every discussion was centered around urgency. Right. And it, it really hit home for me that there is a very large disconnect that we need to work on collectively between there's we got we to gotta fix things on a big level versus like what are my actual day-to-day -day behaviors have right. an impact. Because we all know that unless we're personally doing it at home one by one, it's not going to change. And this is a case like voting that each vote counts, mm -hmm. each person's action counts tremendously. Right. So, and, and just just we'll give one example, we, we collected, um, we s categorized all the single-use utensils, because they're compostable, but they're single-use utensils that only got used once, and there were, um, this is an example of, of better signage that, that we could have had. Um, do yeah. we have the con utensils? Um, yeah, we want to look at, those are the kinds of utensils that you should have yeah, so these are the coulda, shoulda, coulda. These are compostable products that we ended up using, so still better than single-use oh, okay. plastics. So oh, everything terrific. was compostable. But I wanted to see if we could show the picture of the bins um, with the single-use compostable utensils, um, because it really hit home for me that we, yeah, here we go. So that was, that was all the single, sorry, that was probably 35% of the compostable utensils that were used at the, at the event. That's close to 200 pounds. And you know how, you know how little a single-use fork weighs, right. close to 200 pounds of single-use items, and it really hit home for me, why, where was, where was the outrage, where was the demand, where was the behavior shift of like, oh, they're serving single-use items, even if they're compostable, I'm going to bring my own utensil, or I'm going to, I'm going to use my own cup. So that they, really... They, they were very good about the water issue. That's true. I noticed true. a lot of people walking around with water bottles, mm -hmm. and the convention center has the re refillable water stations which was excellent. But then in the evenings, I saw everyone with the plastic right. cups with their beer and wine. Right. And those ended up in what you saw was non-discernible, uh, right. compostable things <laughs> all plunged into it. Right. So it, it, really, yeah. it really hit home for me that, like, yes, we did better. These were the actual bins. These were the actual bins. And so this, this kind of highlights that how we, that you saw earlier the signage where there's samples of what should go where. Um, but in this case, the, the, for the, what actually happened in the convention center, the signage was a bit more muted. It was more... It was very muted, and we noticed in that picture that it was very distant from where the people actually were. So you had to seek out those bins, right. and they weren't in the traffic flow. So people were in a hurry between 1,200 mm -hmm. different conferences and workshops and looking for a place to chuck their stuff. Yeah, so, so that's another thing we've learned. We've run out of time. Okay. We're clearly going to have to have another show to talk about this more. You're always full of great information. And we're definitely going to learn this for our future conferences, but be very happy with the gains that we did make. Yes, absolutely. Thank you love for coming. Love lessons. And please join us next Tuesday on Sustainable Hawaii at 12 noon.